ago. Um, um, I started, the, the guy who started me running was basically the, at the end of his running career, he, although he was younger than I am now. And, um, and you know, um, he got me fit enough to start training with some of the better athletes. Um, I actually, I remember that first first run which was a three kilometer loop that he drove us to and um and you know the sense of freedom the i it, it was i was exultant and you know i just felt like uh, i was flying um the funny thing was at the end of that 3k loop he told me we we're gonna do another one <laughs> uh, i thought i was gonna die and i wouldn't be able to do it and um but you know i, I and i guess that's something i've i've learned you know i um, you know, I managed to finish that second lap. I didn't die, and uh, and it, you know, maybe it sounds a bit of a cliche, but that, if you like, was um, uh, I the cliche for my life, if you like. Um, I if I wanted to succeed, I had to do the second lap, and that's what I've always tried to do. Um, the extra, yeah, that extra lap, yeah, just go that extra distance, and um, you know, that was when I learned for the first time uh, after. A, couple of months regular training that I could afford to dream and um, and I started getting my confidence and self-belief back um, that I'd lost during my teens with the with my sight going and um, and I started to mature and become the person I am today. Your next track is Cindy Lauper time after time what mm -hmm. does this mean to you? It takes me back to the um, New York Paralympics. Um, we'd made it onto the same continent by 1984, um, but um, not the same stadium. They, they were held in Los Angeles. Um, it, it was it was an amazing game. So 10,000 people at the opening ceremony crammed into the stadium that were opened by President Reagan. And I thought, you know, I'd arrived. You know, I'd made international um, the international athletic field, and um, and I thought, you know. I, you know, this is great, I've, I want more of this. And I, I was brought down to earth a couple of days later when, um, for the benefit of the athletes, the, the, the public address uh, system read out the names of the spectators. Um, but uh, there, there were that few people in the stadium. Um, but um, Cindy Lauper was playing on the... I got my first Walkman in New York and I remember listening to the ra local radio station and time after time was the track that was being played. I'm talking to Rob Matthews. You mentioned New York, 1984. Three gold medals you won in those Paralympics, didn't you? Yeah, I was just visualising it all as uh, I was hearing that record. And just, you know, I set two world records in the 800 uh, on the way as well. Um, that must have been such a blast. Oh, it was just amazing that, you know, just... Um, just I could, you know, almost visualise the atmosphere um, as I was listening. And, uh, you know, I ran... 205 in the um, in the qualifying round um, for the 800 metres and then in the final I knocked a three seconds off that when I ran 202.3 and um, yeah and, and the competition had really come on since the year before my um, first international was in Bulgaria in 1983 and and really um, I think I'd, I woke up the opposition because um, the Norwegian had won everything at a canter until then and um by 1984, he'd been really training hard, and um, he ran under the world record um, just behind me. As opposed to goal ball, blind runners mm -hmm. are not blindfolded, are they? No. Should they be? Although um, uh, for the 1500 metres and below now, you have to wear blacked out glasses, and I think yes. Oh, they they're should completely be. blacked out. Yeah, yeah, okay. and I think that's a I think that's a great uh, step forward. I I don't really understand why they don't have to wear blacked out glasses for all of the distances because, you know, there has been controversy in the past as to whether. Um, uh, an athlete has some useful vision, and even if you can see the white line on the track, that's the significant advantage. Yeah, yeah. So the main thing stopping you from being as well. This is such a stupid question. I'm sorry I even started it. But the thing that's stopping you from being as good as the fastest sightest runner mm. is the fact that you cannot see. Yeah. It, but more than that, trying to extricate myself from the stupid hole I dug myself <laughs> into, it's. It's it's a lack of confidence that stops you going faster. The lack of full confidence about where the corner goes. 
I don't think I, I don't think I lack for confidence when I'm when I'm running. So why I, can't you run as fast as the, as the side? I can only run as fast as the runner I'm running with. But you know, it, it's having the regu- the guide runners to run with uh, day in and day out whenever I want to go for a run, when uh, wherever I want to go. I mean, obviously there are some courses that I run on that I can't run as fast as a sighted runner. I, I do. I've done a lot of cross country races and. You know that, that I reckon I'm about two minutes slow on the country over eight k um than I am on the road, for instance, um just by virtue of the fact that you know sometimes I do hit a a, a, a dip or a bump and uh, you know you lose your stride for a minute, but you know I've competed in cross country races where I've jumped jumped streams and jumped logs at the top of banks, and you know um such you, an act of faith. Is that an act of faith and blind faith? Yeah, blind faith. <laughs> yes, mm. I mean it is. You, but you, you know, you don't get anywhere if you don't trust people, and it's a it's a mutual thing. My guide runners have to know that I'm going to do what they want me to do when they say it, and um, and I've got to know that they're going to, um, you know, guide me over things and tell me about a curb. And I think having been able to see that really has uh, helped me and I you know I can visualize what a, a curb looks like I can visualize what a track winding through the woods is like and and that's helped me appreciate my surroundings more as well the whole idea of being blind makes me think that you are you either have to become a very trusting person or a very untrusting person you know or, you have to trust take... that guide runner you have to trust that guide dog you, you you have to let yourself go. It's like those exercises they do where mm. you fall backwards and yeah. you trust somebody to catch you. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you, you you do have to. I mean, it's the nature of the beast. But, um, you know, you move on, you get on with life. And I, it's something I really don't think about. I mean, you know, as one of my guide runners said, that, you know, he, he's he's not going to worry if, if, if I do brush something or just catch a clip a lamppost or whatever because, you know, if I'm stupid enough to run and I'm blind, then it's my problem. And that's the way I look at it. You know, I, I make I make the choices, I make the decisions. It was, you know, you know, it was my choice to to get on a plane to Auckland uh, three and a half years ago, and uh, you know, look where that's taken me. Why did you get on a plane to Auckland? New Zealand was a country I'd always wanted to to visit. I, it seems as if all all poms want to come to New Zealand from the poms I've spoken to here, but. Um, I it, it had been an ambition for a long time, but because of my running and not having guide runners, um, I wasn't able to take the opportunity. Then I had a break in the training schedule, and a friend invited me out here, and um, and I was on the train uh, on a plane about three weeks after that. And um, you know, it's mind blowing to just land at Auckland Airport, walk through, and think. I'm in Auckland. I'm in New Zealand. It was just amazing, and 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 I just loved the place straight away. It just seemed sunnier, warmer, the people much more friendly and um, you know I, 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 I could have almost not taken the plane home yeah. and then you fell in love uh, yeah, yes I did um, um, I went to um, I was walking along the um, viaduct and um, my friend said uh, you know, let's go in the soul bar and um, then I, I um, walked in there and bumped into Sarah and after I'd picked her up and made sure she was okay, uh, <laughs> ha ha. <laughs> um, we got, How we many got, times have you told that joke? Um, uh, uh-huh. two thousand. You met your soulmate in the soul yeah. bar. Yeah, and uh, and it was it was love at first touch. And you uh, got married, <laughs> lived happily ever after. Yeah. So far, so good. Yeah, I mean the next eighteen months were just amazing. You know, I, I um, emigrated with my guide dog um, in June. Um, and uh, we got married, bought a house, and 18 months to the day after we met, Thomas was born. Our guide, sorry, I'm not meaning to distract you from telling me about Thomas, whom is the light of your life, but uh-huh. um, are guide dogs exempt from quarantine? Um, they are, but you have to have um, all sorts of blood tests and um, uh, a pet passport. So my dog's got her own pet passport. And, um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's about... Um, six weeks of six weeks it took to get all the um, all that sorted. And what?